The Pharmacist's Guide to Code Blue Emergencies, Part 1. Code Blue is announced in the overhead speaker, and it sends a jolt through your nervous system. A rush of adrenaline flows as you grab your tote and make your way over to the ICU. What is going to happen next? What will be my role as a pharmacist in charge of the medications? Luckily, as you will learn from this two-part instructional video, the ACLS algorithms have been simplified over the years so that the approach is very organized and basic. Still, it's good to understand the process, organize yourself, and be prepared. So what is the role of the pharmacist during Code Blue emergencies? The pharmacist is responsible to prepare all medications used during the code and guide their administration. Anticipation by the pharmacist is essential. Always be one step ahead of what's going on. It's important to look at the cardiac monitor to know what to reach for and what to set up to be ready. And pre-made syringes and bags are convenience. You may have seen the chain of survival before. This chain applies to cardiac arrest outside the hospital. If all five links in the chain come together quickly, there's a good chance for survival. This means early access to the patient, early CPR and defibrillation, and early ACLS with early post-resuscitative care, if they all come together, there's a good chance for the patient to survive. Quick response of the patient equals better outcomes. Code Blues follow ACLS guidelines. They're considered the gold standard and are endorsed by the American Heart Association. They are published in the journal Circulation. The full ACLS guidelines were last published in 2010. In 2013, 2015, and 2019, the American Heart Association published updates to the 2010 guidelines. These served as focused updates rather than a complete revision of the guidelines. The 2015 guideline focused on topics with significant new science or ongoing controversy. They emphasized evidence-based criteria. Pharmacists are usually members of the Code Blue response team. This team consists of hospital personnel and defibrillation equipment capable of delivering advanced cardiac life support, or ACLS. What is a rapid response team? The rapid response team gets to the patient before a Code Blue is called. It's important to know the three major types of cardiac arrest, asystole or flatline, pulseless electrical activity, or PEA, and pulseless VTAC or VFib, ventricular tachycardia, or ventricular fibrillation. What does the term ROSC mean? ROSC stands for Return of Spontaneous Circulation. It's the resumption of a sustained heart rhythm that perfuses the body after cardiac arrest. You can see in this table that ROSC is achieved after cardiac arrest in approximately 57% of patients. It occurs more often in pulseless VTAC or VFib at 72%. The next question to ask is, what is the percentage of patients discharged out of the hospital after cardiac arrest? And the total number comes up to 19%, or one in five patients that are discharged out of the hospital after a cold blue. If the patient has had pulseless VTAC or VFib, they have a better chance at 40%. So ACLS interventions, including IV drugs, resulted in an increased rate of ROSC, but there was no statistical difference in survival to hospital discharge. The first type of cardiac arrest is called asystole or flatline. You can see on the cardiac tracing that there is no discernible electrical activity on the ECG. Here's the ACLS algorithm for asystole. It's very simple as you can see. Administer CPR, intubate and establish IV access, and then administer epinephrine one milligram IV push every three to five minutes. Let's talk about epinephrine. Epinephrine has dose related effects. At lower doses, epinephrine activates beta one and beta two receptors. At higher doses, epinephrine activates beta-1 and alpha receptors. 
Alpha stimulation causes vasoconstriction. This vasoconstriction preserves blood flow to the brain and heart. It also increases coronary perfusion and cerebral perfusion pressure during CPR. A major side effect of epinephrine is that it can irritate the heart, causing arrhythmias. The dose of epinephrine is one milligram every three to five minutes. Caution should be used because epinephrine comes in different concentrations depending on the dosage form. The most common dosage form that's used during code blue emergencies is in the bottom left picture, which is the pre-filled syringe. This contains one milligram per 10 ml. In contrast, the ampule in the middle has the same amount of drug, one milligram, but in only one ml of solution, so it's highly concentrated. This drug or dosage form is used for bee stings or anaphylactic reactions, where you need to give a dose uh, either IM or sub Q. The vial to the right in the right picture shows the high dose epinephrine. Uh, it's one milligram per ml concentration. This vial is used for administration of high dose epi and also for manufacturing purposes. Occasionally, high dose epinephrine is requested. It does have a demonstrated ROSC advantage. However, because of its lack of proven efficacy as far as survival benefit and concerns of adverse effects such as arrhythmias, high dose epi is not recommended by ACLS in cardiac arrest. If asked, these are the high dose epinephrine regimens that have been used in the past, either escalating dose epi or high dose epi. Vasopressin is an endogenous hormone. It causes profound vasoconstriction similar to epinephrine. Vasopressin did not show benefit for ROSC or survival to discharge compared to epinephrine. Therefore, it was removed from the ACLS guidelines in November of 2015. Current guidelines state that it may be used in combination with epinephrine, but not as a substitute for it. Isoproteranol or isoprel might be used in asystole, but it is not ACLS recommended. It's a pure beta agonist activating beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. It speeds up the heart on the adrenergic side. However, we can only give it as a drip, never give it as IV push. And the side effect is that it is highly arrhythmogenic. The second type of cardiac arrest is called pulseless electrical activity, or PEA, which is any organized rhythm without a pulse. An electrical waveform is seen on the ECG, but no pulse can be felt. No pulse means no blood flow. It was previously called electrical mechanical dissociation, or EMD. You can see that the ACLS algorithm for PEA is very similar to asystole, where we initiate CPR, intubate and establish IV access, and then give epinephrine one milligram IV push every three to five minutes. The additional part of the algorithm is to identify and treat reversible causes. We need to search out for those reversible causes. The most common cause is bleeding or severe volume depletion, which can be treated with fluids such as NS. The second most common cause of PEA are electrolyte abnormalities. So we need to check for hypo or hyperkalemia or low magnesium levels. Other reversible causes for PEA include cardiac tamponade, especially after cardiac surgery, acidosis, hypothermia, or thrombosis, either coronary or pulmonary embolus. Here is a picture of what cardiac tamponade looks like. A buildup of blood or other fluid in the pericardial sac puts pressure on the heart, which may prevent it from pumping effectively. The way that this pressure is relieved is by inserting a needle into the pericardial space and draining the fluid. Let's talk a little bit about calcium because it can be requested during cold blues. Calcium's routine use in cardiac arrest is not recommended by ACLS. However, it has been used in pulseless electrical activity or PEA. The 
The theory behind this is that it assists in cardiac muscle contractility as an inotrope. When can calcium be used per ACLS guidelines? The three really true indications for calcium are hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia with associated EKG abnormalities, and calcium channel blocker overdose. Let's talk about some of the differences between calcium chloride and calcium gluconate. Calcium chloride contains more calcium than calcium gluconate. It's about three times as much elemental calcium in calcium chloride. Calcium chloride is ionized and rapidly released, so it is the dosage form that's used in cold blues. Calcium gluconate, on the other hand, is slowly released. It can be given peripherally and is less irritating on the vein, but is not used during cold blues. In summary, we previously reviewed the ACLS guidelines that are used in cold blues, presented the three major types of cardiac arrest and their outcomes. We discussed the asystole and PEA algorithms and the importance of identifying reversible causes and we outline the importance of epinephrine administration. Next up, we're going to review the VFib VTAC ACLS algorithms, describe the use of the antiarrhythmics amiodarone and lidocaine, and present other drugs and routes of administration used during cardiac arrest. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEasy Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy.